Hello. Thank you for coming to the, what I think is the only sound adjacent talk. <laughs> so we'll have to, we'll have to do better next time. But um, <clears throat> is everyone here interested in, in particular in sound or is, is it the data assets that drew you? It's, it's exciting stuff, right? <laughs> Okay, so just a quick introduction of who I am. My name is Dan Reynolds, and I work on the audio engine development team as a technical sound designer. So my role is kind of unusual uh, in that um, <clears throat> I don't specifically work on game content. Uh, I My primary role on the team is is basically to consult with uh, the programming team, the audio programming team, with new feature development, and um, basically help them test ideas by prototyping and creating sort of a simulation of a production, uh, kind of like a first user. And then I give them feedback, and we debate, we have arguments, and uh, eventually we roll out some new feature, and then I will help test it, and then maybe show it off. So we'll see. So actually, in a couple weeks here, I'm going to be giving a live stream on the new time synth, which just came out. So that's an example. OK, so uh, <clears throat> data-driven sound design. Uh, so I'm. What I find really interesting about the Unreal Engine is that uh, it has a lot of surface area. So I'm constantly discovering new things that are not new things. And so data assets are the, the new thing that's not a new thing for me. Uh, and so I'm excited about them. Um, but I don't want to like, I'm not like trying to proselytize everyone. You know, you don't have to go away and think data assets are the answer. But if you haven't used them before, and I'm just going to pretend uh, that none of you have, um, <clears throat> then maybe you, you, know, you can just add them to your toolkit or your arsenal or whatever. That's the hope. OK, so to clear up any uh, conflation, because data-driven is a popular word or phrase, um, what, what I'm talking about in particular here is uh, <clears throat> basically uh, looking at your design, like take, basically taking a design philosophy that is itself focused on like parameter-driven uh, representations of your behavior. So um, <clears throat> we will sort of look at a test case uh, in that process, and uh, then eventually get to data assets and see how maybe they can help us as designers um, create more robust systems or tools for our team, hopefully without involving a programmer, which is awesome. So, um, <clears throat> so what I mean is basically design approaches that are oriented around parameter data, and in uh, our case, static data. So this is usually defining thresholds and ranges and scalars. Um, and if you're familiar with more procedural design techniques, then you're probably already doing this. You're probably already conceiving of your design in terms of parameter data. So we'll just take a look at an example. So. <clears throat> In 422, we released a new project, a sample project called the Spatial Audio Temple. And uh, this project was basically uh, a directive for me to create a sample project that showed off partnerships that we had with various spatial audio plugin vendors. So, Steam Audio, Oculus Audio, and uh, Resonance from Google. And so I took the Sun Temple project, because we don't have any artists on our team, 
and uh, it looked pretty. It was the Sun Temple original project was to show off mobile textures, and uh, incidentally, for Steam Audio, it ended up being a really great project because the sort of natural architecture of the level lent itself very nicely to uh, simulated wave propagation, um, <clears throat> which is unusual because a lot of game art doesn't really think about the acoustics <laughs> of a space. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, one of the things that we were sort of frustrated as a team, just in general, with the trend in spatial audio demos was uh, they tend to be very bombastic and like a, a white box level with like a voice saying, this is an example of HRTF processing. And you're like walking around corners and stuff like that. Um, or they have like, for some reason, like techno music or cumbia. I don't know, one of those two. So uh, <laughs> one of the things, like those aren't really good examples of, I'm sure they're, they're great at exposing uh, spatialization, but they kind of fail in simulating a game experience. <laughs> I mean, I hope. <laughs> and maybe the teams working on those products play very specific games, but uh, not, not, not us. And so uh, the idea was to create sort of a pleasing, nuance-filled ambience, something very natural sounding, um, so that hopefully uh, you could see kind of each plugin in their best in their best case, because you're not going to be like working on a plugin and going, this sounds terrible, but this is the plugin we chose. You're going to try to <laughs> make it sound good. So that was the idea. And um, I wanted an experience where people could chill out and uh, sort of listen carefully for a long period. Uh, so I wanted to create sort of a natural um, procedural ambience that uh, Procedural meaning that uh, it wouldn't be, um, it would be a little bit more programmatic in the sense simulating a natural experience. So, um, <clears throat> so one of the first uh, th things that I started building was this sort of procedural bird song system. So you could, if you're a sound designer, then your property are, we talked about what I'm not going to term I'm not going to, uh, for data-driven design, there's the other way of thinking of data-driven design where you analyze points of data and then you uh, create design based off of whatever inference you make of that data. Um, as sound designers, you probably already do this <laughs> because you listen and that's your data point. Um, but uh, in this case, I was listening to Birdsong and uh, thinking about there's certain kinds of birds that, uh, like, they, little, they sing little tweets, and then they take a rest, and then they tweet some more. Um, and uh, so what I decided to do was kind of take a semi-granular approach, um, where, <clears throat> uh, and this is actually what shipped in the Spatial Audio Temple. I, the Spatial Audio Temple was actually finished uh, about a year ago or more. Um, it just took a long time to get out. But, um, but yeah, basically uh, cutting up, I was actually an isotope lassoing individual bird tweets, uh, just little chirps, and uh, <clears throat> taking those samples and then creating a system wherein uh, you had two timers. You had sort of a small timer and a large timer. And, um, we can kind of see how that's built here. All right, so there's a couple of API stuff here for like starting the thing if I want to do it manually or if it like automatically does it. But uh, essentially you can see here, I'm using event timers. And for some reason I have a, we don't need that in there. Um, <clears throat> I'm using event timers and uh, basically creating like a phrase system wherein individual chirps would be like words in a phrase. And then um, you would have a large timer that would time the instance of a phrase occurring. 
and then uh, a small timer, which would be responsible for concatenating uh, words into a phrase or a little individual bird chirps into like a longer song. So you can see here I have an event timer and then it executes a sequence. And I just use a good old fashioned loop and a delay for the individual sequence. And um, <clears throat> you can see here I have things like min timer, max timer, so I have these float ranges uh, so that I could sort of tune the bird song, the, fra the, the time between phrases. Um, how many, uh, this is, uh, this probably shouldn't say spawn, I'm not, one of the, the things that I wanted to do was here not use any audio components, because why? I'm just, they're just playing a sound at one location, not moving, I'm not modulating them, no reason for an audio component. So I'm actually just using play sound, so spawn is probably not the correct word to use there, but uh, uh, the minimum number of words or tweets that would go into a phrase, the max that would go into a phrase, um, and using a lot of randomization uh, with these ranges. This is uh, location, so I wanted to be able to place like this actor in a tree and uh, give that a radius in the tree, and then each phrase would sort of have one location, so the phrase would occur at one location, and then and the next time around, it would pick a new location. And this was important because without doing that, I did like random location, and it was just like quantum speed bird, <laughs> just like <laughs> teleporting all around the tree. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, that was a, not quite right sounding. So yeah, this way we could have, oh, there's a bird over here. It's clearly like lo localized. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, the next one would be like over here. So it sounded like there are little conversations happening, uh, which was cool. Um, and then uh, you'll notice that I wrapped a lot of simple things into, into functions, which I did later on. Um, but then, yeah, here I do like an easy counter to break, and then this I added at the end, uh, which I'll explain why I added that. Um, and uh, then, you know, start or not start another timer. That way I could do one phrase. So if I, I set up the API, so if I just wanted a, some external controller to go play a bird phrase, and then it would do it, and then it would just stop. Um, or I could just set them to auto just do your thing and keep going. Um, yeah, so I was pretty pleased with this. I might, I might, uh, oh, I'll show stuff after. What, what, so anyway, I was like, okay, yeah, cool. Now I got birds. All right, I got a little bird system. And I had everything named or bird oriented, like <laughs> function names and like events. It was like tweet and chirps and stuff like that. And then I was like, okay, well, I also want like ocean ambience where I have like surf sounds. I was like, maybe I'd make something very similar. And I was like, wait a second, why can't I just use this? Like it's kind of doing everything I want. And so I just, I kept revisiting this actor over and over. Every time I was like, wow, now I need like fire, fire crackles over little torches. Like why not, let's just use this again. And so I kept, going back and adding things, the uh, play word at phrase location was, or, or sorry, the end phrase action was uh, added when I wanted to make cicada sounds. And cicadas have like this sort of <clears throat> pattern where they like, they do these little it's like their, ling their wings clacking together or something. And then they go at the end. <laughs> And I was like, well, wait a second. I didn't, <laughs> I built this for like random selection. I didn't think about like what could ha what happen at the beginning, what happened at the end. So you know, it's something that you could continue to expand on. But what I found really uh, interesting is every time I added a feature, I started realizing that I was creating a tool. And I was like, I could take this to a new project or wherever and use it over and over again. 
And so that I thought was really powerful. I was like, cool. So here's a, a subtle kind of horrible white box as they are. I think it should work. We should get some chill. Unfortunately, we only got mono. But you can kind of, there's some cicadas. Looks sort of like a field of cicadas around us. And you can do things like, you can use concurrency to manage how many cicadas are actually running at once, which I think I do. I use concurrency on the bird tweets to manage, like I don't want any individual bird tweeting more than two tweets at a time. And so that way when you concatenate, if there's a little bit of tail, it cuts it down, cuts down how many concurrent sounds are out. But basically you get this nice sort of natural ambience and you could listen to this for a really long time. <laughs> I remember in my office, like seven one surround, and I'm just like, oh yeah, this is nice. Turn the lights off. It's like, oh yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> All right, so if we look at one of these actors, we can see. Okay, so here's a, here I have sounds to play. This is, I just decided to wrap it in a sound cue. Nothing special there, it's just random sounds. Some flags, auto start, repeat, attenuation settings, concurrency settings, I can add those. I, I, I decided to create an option to override, which I thought was nice. So the individual actor could have their own attenuation uh, definition, their own concurrency definition. Um, and then here's all my parameters. So this is a bird, I think I selected. So this is design, this is cool. Um, but there's a problem with this. So this is, this is what I would consider procedural sound design, that's cool. There's a couple problems. So <clears throat> the main problem is that all of this data is instanced, okay? So what we were selecting in the level is an instance of our actor class, right? So the class that I was, the, the blueprint that I was editing is our class definition. What was in the level is an instance of that class, all right? So the problem is that that any changes I make inside of those parameters on instance version is owned by that level. It's owned by the instance and the instance is owned by the level. All right, so that means a couple of things. One, if you're working in a shared design space, uh, let's say you've got a small team and <laughs> you're sharing a UMAP, across maybe multiple designers, that means that uh, source control becomes an issue. So if you have the source control plugin, then you're constantly like <laughs> negotiating time. <laughs> and you're like, oh, hey man, I see you've checked out the, you know, the bird map. <laughs> Can you let me know when you check it in because I gotta work on it, I gotta tweak some values, right? Or, or worse, if you're like working on some third party, you know, source control, like I, I use Bitbucket at home sometimes. Uh, you never know, someone might like stomp all your data like underneath you, right? So it's, it's kind of a, a scary place. Um, and then the other thing is that I've gone through all the work of tweaking those values and making like really great birds. <laughs> and so what if I want to move it to another level? What if I want to use, like this is a great bird, I need to use this in four other levels. Then I have like this awkward copy and paste thing in front of me or, I don't know, like it's, it's not very portable. So um, <clears throat> that's where we come to data assets. You can think of a data asset as a single row entry on a data table, right? And a table hopefully uh, you all know what that is. You could ask me questions after, uh, I'll attempt to answer if that's not one that you know, but hopefully you do. Hopefully you've have, you have like post-traumatic stress from like working in Excel 
and you you get it. Um, <clears throat> so so yeah, think of it as a single row entry, and think about times when you are you basically have a data pattern, and you use this data pattern over and over again. And in the same way as I created, I use the same actor for birds and cicadas and bees, although we didn't hear a bee, that's, that's very rare bees in that, in that level. Um, <clears throat> different kinds of birds, different species of birds. Um, all that data is just part of the instance. It's completely static data. They're just definitions. They're just behavioral definitions, right? So when you're in that situation, a data asset might be what you want. All right, so maybe you've used data blueprints in the past. Um, and so there are some reasons you might want to use a data asset, and some reasons you might want to use a data blueprint. I would err toward the data asset. I think the data blueprint tends to be a little bit more than you need sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so for a data blueprint, if you haven't used a data blueprint before, basically, if you have, a say, a blueprint actor, um, and then you make a child version of that actor, as an example, and you open it once, and you close the editor and do nothing. And then you open it again, magically becomes a data blueprint. Where it just shows, instead of seeing the graph, it just shows the uh, class parameters. Uh, and then you can edit those. Um, <clears throat> and that's fine. But the power of uh, child-parent uh, hierarchy is, in my opinion, inheritance, functional inheritance, and more than that, overriding and creating new functionality. Um, so I'm not sure if you, oh, like, I see people use data blueprints sometimes when maybe a data asset would be better. Um, however, uh, right, so, oh yeah, so data assets are of the same type, which is cool. So blueprints are child parents, so they're actually different types. They're inherited types, but they're different types. So you always have to do awkward casting to like use them. Data assets are the same type, so you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to do wacky casting or anything like that. Um, they both allow you to create APIs, which is cool. Uh, so if you want to create some helper functions um, or some sort of calculation, then it's possible. Um, <clears throat> data blueprints are kind of like full objects. They, uh, they can support dynamic runtime data. So if you have data that's like, for example, on that uh, little bird, my little bird system, right? There's like local, locally stored data. I'm counting number of sp spawns, like I'm store, like I'm storing location data. All that stuff, all this non-public stuff, that is dynamic, right? It's runtime dynamic. So it's appropriate for this to be a blueprint. Um, whereas with data assets, they're, they're basically for static data only. And that's like my definition. So what, what we see here in, in my uh, class is kind of a conflation of two things. One is the sort of model of behavior. And then the other thing is the control of that behavior. And that is my data th thresholds, all my little definitions. Those don't actually need to be on the same object. So we can have both. All right. So what would we have to do to uh, create data assets? So <clears throat> first, we can wrap our parameter instance data. We have to make some decisions, though, right? Because we have basically conflated these two ideas. And we have to decide, what exactly am I trying to isolate? Right? So 
We also want to make sure the data asset has everything we need for its API. If it's getters, if there's little weird calculators you need, then you want to build that in. And here's where you need to clarify your design. So um, when I was converting this for this presentation, uh, I realized that base volume and base pitch are not part of playback behavior. They're like part of the mix behavior, which is contextual to an instance object. And so I felt that those should not be part of the playback behavior definitions. So I kept that on there. Um, and then what's cool is the portability. So if we look at the same version, we say, no, don't save anything. Oop, okay. So here's our actor, and it looks very similar. The only difference is if we look at the class defaults, I'm gonna look on this one that's closer to me, we can see we have a lot of the same stuff in here, right? Auto start, repeat, we like this stuff. It's, it feels like good local control mechanisms. Our attenuation settings, like I've said, feels like it should be contextual um, because if I move it from level to level, I may want different attenuation settings. Uh, I don't necessarily want that married to the particular bird or cicada or whatever. Concurrency, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And then you can see I have volume and pitch. Uh, and then of course, this is our runtime data, right? The number of spawns is, is our dynamic data. There's no reason for that to be public. Is that public? Oh, number of spawns? Well, anyway, um, that didn't belong on, the, uh, on our uh, data asset type. The way that you create a data asset is pretty easy. You just add a new blueprint class, and you go down to this all classes triangle, and you just start typing data asset, and you'll see primary data asset. And what it will make is a little blue, blue blueprint it looks like this. Um, and you get a graph, and you get it's just very familiar, right? Um, here are my playback behavior variables. Everything I felt was part of I consolidated the end action. So we still we kept that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and that was it. I didn't feel like I needed any helper functions. Uh, none of these have to be made public or instanceable or anything like that. You don't have to worry about that. Um, all of this stuff is gettable. Uh, and then what we can do now is we can right click to that wonderful miscellaneous sub <laughs> subcategory and locate data asset right there. And it'll give us a little picker. And then from here we can pick Whatever we called it, ambient sound data is what I called mine. You can see there's other data assets in there as well. And we just select that, and I've got a brand new one. And it has all the defaults that are part of the class, which unfortunately I put nothing in there, which is kind of terrible. So you, you probably want to preload that with defaults that feel good. Um, but we can look at here, I have bird A. I have actually three different species of birds. Yeah, these different sounds, different parameters. Uh, and then I have my little bee, a little bee guy. And uh, that's my cicada with its end phrase. And yeah, I mean, it should sound the same when we get to it. They start coming in, yeah. I put the birds. I think this is one of them. I put them next to these cylinders. Yeah. I think that's bird C. Super infrequent. There's a near cicada. We could have, play, you know, 
we could continue expanding our original asset, keep building it out. Maybe we want a beginning of phrase sound. Maybe we want special behavior based on player proximity. Who knows what this? If you kind of, it's kind of a, a black hole you can keep going down into with now photographic evidence. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so that's okay. So that's an example of taking a system we've designed and then making data assets. And what what when you get into this and you start realizing that this is everywhere. <laughs> like it's all over the place. It's everywhere. Um, it's basically a common paradigm of the Unreal Engine. Uh, you see all this asset-oriented data driven systems, right? So um, you notice things like attenuation settings are already doing this. Concurrency settings are already doing this. Effect settings, um, you know, reverb and compression are great examples where you're just setting thresholds. They are completely dynamic, right? The, the master reverb has, you know, send data that ba is based off of distance from player. Um, compression acts, right, as a system itself is dynamic. But the, the actual preset settings are static. So what you see here is the wonderful modular synthesizer with a billion settings. <clears throat> um, and so synthesizers are a great example of this, this approach to sound design, right? Like all of those settings create a sound, define a sound. So we've got our, uh, our data asset hammer. Now we need to look for design nails. And uh, so I felt like the granular synth would be a good opportunity to kind of uh, look, at, look at using data assets uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, <clears throat> the granular synth was written by Aaron, my, my boss, uh, on like a Sunday. He ripped through it uh, from January to January 2017 to GDC 2017. We were crunching for our announcement of the new audio engine. And we were supporting the new audio engine on Robo Recall <laughs> during the weekdays. And the weekends, Aaron would go home and he'd like come back having written like a bunch of effects over the weekend. Like here's, you know, three new source effects, like chorus and delays. And uh, then one weekend he went away and he returned and he created a granular synthesizer. And I was like, oh man, that's, that's crazy. Um, and it's, it's very cool, but you know, that was the time he had to work on it as you know, so far and it works. But uh, it kind of needs a preset because it takes like 20 function calls to actually start using it. And if you don't know or have never used a granular synthesizer, that's a rough 20 functions. <laughs> so uh, does, ever, does anyone not know what a granular synthesizer is? A few? So basically a granular synthesizer in, in this case um, <clears throat> takes a, uh, a single sound wave, completely decodes it, and then allows you to take that sound and uh, essentially uh, play back tiny pieces of that sound. And uh, you can do things like play back uh, a dozen pieces of that sound at once. Uh, or it's, you can kind of think of it as like a sound particle effect. So um, that's the idea, essentially. But there's a lot of parameterization, like any particle effect would have, um, that, that needs to be set. Uh, and so data assets, well, we've just had this experience with the birds and the bees. So maybe we could create a preset for that, for our granular synthesizer. And more than that, we want it now. And the programmer is busy. Okay, so um, what do we need? Well, first we need to set up our data assets data layout. Um, I was 
going to do this completely live, but I realized it took a long time and it'd be really boring to watch me do it. Um, so I, I did it in advance. Uh, so we can just walk through it. Um, <clears throat> we want to create a function that allows us to apply a preset. That's simple. Uh, and then we can take it a step further by creating, say, a mod mapping system, right? Because you have these complex uh, parameter parameters, and maybe you want to map some sort of modulation input to multiple destinations. Um, the subtractive synthesizer has this. Why not our granular synth, right? Um, and then maybe create a function to normalize curves if we want nonlinear curves, because why not? We're creating our own our own cool API. So let's take a look. All right, so we don't want to save. So I've created a couple things here uh, just to help with our demonstration. Uh, the first is a little widget so we can start our sound, stop our sound, and modulate our sound. And this is nothing special. This is just uh, just a little widget. Um, we have a couple things going on here. We have our data asset, and it's a little bit messy. All right, so here's our, whatever, 20 functions, something like that. Um, and these are all required <laughs> to set uh, before you can really get anything interesting coming out of the granular synth. What a pain in the butt to do that over and over and over again inside of every place you want to use a granular synth. So um, I, uh, I decided, hey, we'll just have a function that inputs a reference to a granular synth component. And I probably should have validated it first. Did I do that? No. So that would be good. We'll do it is valid there in version 2. Um, so we check to make sure that we actually have a valid grain and a synth coming in here. Then uh, we set envelope information for our node on, node off. All right, your standard attack, decay, sustain, and release. So these all relate to our envelope, our overall envelopes sound. Um, <clears throat> and here I have parameters coming in, boop, 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 right, that are part of my data layout right there. Then I have grain settings. So this is an individual particle. All right. The duration of the particle in milliseconds. The uh, the envelope type. This is uh, you can see here. There's I don't know like a dozen different standard envelope types. Um, you don't have to know what they all are. I mean, you could look up. They're like mathematical equations. You could look them up, but you can also just sort of try them all out and see what you like and what fits for the particular sound you're trying to create. Uh, I encourage exploration. Grain panning, because the, grain, the granular synth is stereo output. And uh, UE4 supports stereo spatialization, which is cool. Um, <clears throat> of course, we don't have stereo set up here. Uh, the grain pitch, so you can individually, you can control the pitch of an individual grain, which is kind of awesome. Um, yeah, the volume of a grain. The probability that a grain will be spawned. Right? So when you, when you hit that node on, um, it has a grain frequency. How many grains per second is it trying to spawn? And then is there a probability? You know, is it 100% or is it 50% every time it tries to, then it will? Um, <clears throat> Then we have some sound settings. Oh, look at this. I did it is valid here. That was smart. So we've got a, a sound wave. That's part of our, where is the sound? It's part of our preset. Uh, and then playhead settings, right? Because you're playing grains from a particular location. So you can say what part of the sound do you want to start spawning sounds from, which uh, means that you can create interesting source sounds that maybe change over time. Um, and so, <clears throat> right. Uh, then uh, for demonstration's sake, we have a simple actor that is implementing this. I, uh, I have a node on function, a node off function, 
and then a set mod value. And then my level is actually managing the difference between the widget, setting the widget, control, the, uh, the actor. So if we play it, hopefully it works. We've got... Some interesting sounds. All right, cool. And so here we can create basically presets of our sounds. Like we click on our actor and we see our data asset reference there. And we can create new, uh, new references. Do I have anything interesting here? What do I do? Water. So here we can see. Here's the, oh, I didn't look at the modulation mapping. Well, anyway. Um, basically, we have a function that takes uh, from a map uh, that is whose key values are, are are just an enum that I created for destinations that I f I felt were valid. A little normalization on a curve, which we didn't even use for this demo, but you can. Um, and, uh, and then which uh, parameter are you updating? And I support, uh, I supported changing, so you can see here, if we open this, make it go up there, we can see <clears throat> uh, a base mapping assuming a normal zero to one input, and then a, uh, a min max. So some of the parameters have ranges and some of them don't. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Now you have a modulation system and a preset, and you didn't have to ask a programmer a single question. There we go, I did it. <laughs> so, if you want to learn more about uh, some of the new features in the new audio engine, you can just go to the Unreal Engine forums and then find the audio under development uh, subcategory. And then I also recommend this book if you're new to Unreal Engine, GameAudioImplementation.com. Um, it was written by Dave Raybold and Richard Stevens. It's a pretty cool book. It's a little bit old. doesn't have any of the new stuff in it. Um, but it's still a pretty good resource. And then there's my Twitter and... Uh, my face, sort of. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm.